we are so proud of how he's used all of these awesome young people to develop that website. Um, now, the truth is they just scan through it so quickly. Please go to the table, the connect table, connect with Nick and Hannah and talk with them about the website. They showed me a couple of the features. It's really incredible. And, um, and you know, I know for so many of us, we know how to navigate our family. This is our congregation. We've been a part of the church for a long time. For some of you, this is your first time coming to be with us. And for many of our friends and our neighbors, some, for some folks, it might be their first time even coming to a church. And so this, this website really takes that into account, uh, really explaining things like how to dress, which is however you want to. <laughs> As you can tell, we dress all sorts of different ways. I've been wearing blues and grays my whole life, so I feel really comfortable in my blues and grays. But if you want to have your red and your wild and your, your funky cool hats and all that stuff, that's all on you. That's awesome. And, uh, but, but the truth is some folks are nervous coming to church, not knowing kind of how to, to navigate all those things. So I'm so excited about that. And also, I'm excited by how God is really blessing us to reach more and more people in our community. And so we want to make sure that it's easy for people to find us and find the different activities that we're doing. Because some of us, we're already wrapped into WhatsApp groups where we know what's going on, or a group me where we know what's going on, or a text thread where we know what's going on. But we want to make sure that if there are other friends or neighbors that want to come, they can easily access what we're doing. Amen? So, great job. Let's give it up for the interns one more time. Job, We're going to continue our conversation about uh, gathering with God. There are kind of three core principles we talk a lot about here, here in Potomac Valley. Really, the call for us to gather, the call for us to serve our community and serve each other, and the call for us to multiply disciples of Jesus. And we, we kind of took the approach of beginning with the end in mind. So a few weeks ago, we talked about multiplying. Uh, last week, we talked about serving. Today, we're going to talk about gathering. And specifically, we're going to focus on gathering with God. And uh, over the next several weeks, we're going to go through a series that really focuses in on us gathering with God, on our personal walk with God, and also us as a community really gathering to worship God and to really live out our faith together. Amen? Amen. Uh, there are a couple uh, family things I do need to talk through. First off, this is a beautiful picture. And, and as Hannah said, you guys look so beautiful. Good looking, sharp looking people. Everybody, I hug y'all. You know, look good, smell good, everything's good. If you don't smell good, that's okay. All of us have those days. <laughs> it don't work out. I'm saying that to say this. And you know what I'm going to say, right? We're just regular people. So you came out to a church of regular people. We are very flawed, we're very human, and we're seeking to serve an awesome God. So if we make mistakes or missteps, please come and talk to us about it. Please engage with us. Please let us know. We have incredible elders and deacons and small group leaders and, and a really uh, committed staff that's here committed to really building up the church, but we're normal people. And <clears throat> normal people make mistakes. Sometimes when you come to church, if things don't always go exactly right, we can transfer that on God. And just to be clear, God is perfect. Okay. All of God's people are flawed. Right. So just wanna make sure you know that up front. I'll tell you the reason why it's good to say that up front. Yesterday, uh, James and Kathy uh, had a celebration of their love. And so the reason why James isn't here, he got baptized this week, they had a celebration of their love, they're off on their honeymoon, so he's not here because he's off on his honeymoon, uh, celebrating the, the love with him and Kathy. But as I was um, pronouncing them man and wife, I called them James Thatcher, as in Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> as opposed to James Hatcher, as in their hatching marriage of love. So I, my, I, did a, I, I added a T where there shouldn't have been a T. And it was really funny. Afterwards, I was like, man, I'm so sorry you invited me to come for your special day. Your family's here. Your mama's here. Y'all got chicken and all sorts of stuff. I'm sorry, James, that I said that. And he said, no problem, Will. You told me you were messed up anyway. That's <laughs> why so I'm like, I just want to let you know up front, there's a benefit to being real from the 
beginning, amen? <laughs> so I just want to let you know that. Now, your first meeting of the day matters. There's an amazing guy that I'm so inspired by his faith. His name is Suryo Tan. And uh, Suryo's story, I posted it on Facebook. If you, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see it. Or if you go to YouTube and just, uh, uh, and just search Suryo, Suryo, S-U-R-Y-O, Suryo Tan, you can see Suryo's story. Suryo was a guy in Indonesia that they call the cleaner. So what that means is, it wasn't that he was cleaning things. Government officials or political operatives, if they needed something sorted out, Suryo was your guy. And when you meet Suryo, you understand this. And Suryo uh, fell in love with his wife, and uh, she's an amazing, beautiful, sweet, soft um, voice lady. And as, when Suryo introduced me to his wife, he said, this is my wife. She used to be a gun runner. And so, I, you know, being from this area, or being a part of this area, as a defense contractor, I'm thinking this must be Bahasa Indonesian translation problem. He says, not defense contractor, gun runner. As in, you know, illegal guns, get, she gets them. She's like, yes, I used to be a gun runner. I was like, what in the world? This is crazy, Suryo. This is crazy what you guys used to do. But Suryo came to know Christ. And after he came to know Christ, Suryo made a decision that he would normally wake up at 2.30 in the morning and get dressed to meet with people to help clean stuff. That's what he would do. And he would get dressed to go meet with former, the former president of Indonesia to help sort things out. And he said, that's how I used, I used to get dressed in nice clothes early in the morning to have early morning meetings. Suryo made a decision that since he decided to follow Jesus, he would wake up just the same. Suryo wakes up at 2.30 every morning, puts on a suit, and has his quiet time. And reads his Bible and prays because he says the first meeting matters. I remember talking with Suryo about this and it really moved my heart. And as I looked at the scriptures, I realized that this former cleaner and his wife, a former gun runner, now disciples of Jesus, who've decided to clean up their businesses. He had to close down all of his businesses for three years, get things right. He lost a lot, a lot of money, but all of his businesses are clean and legal. Super proud of him. And every year, I get an opportunity to see him. I didn't get to see him this year, but I typically see Suryo every year. He's a good friend. I realize that his conviction is a conviction that I believe we all need. That the first meeting that you have is the most important. And I pray that that meeting is with God. Let's go to God in a word of prayer as we dig into the scriptures. Our God, Father, as we look at your word, open our eyes to understand it. Thank you, God, that you take us from such wild and crazy places and bring us through the power of your Holy Spirit into a place where we can be restored. I thank you, God, that you would transform us and call us to be your followers. God, we recognize that we are flawed, broken people. We desperately need you, God, and we pray that even right now you would have mercy on us as we look at your word. God, I pray that nothing that's said today is confusing, but that it's clear. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict all of our hearts as we look at the scriptures and help us, God, to walk with you in faith and in faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn up to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, we're going to see Moses and Joshua. And Moses has a great practice of meeting with God. Meeting with God outside the camp. This is, of course, a precursor and a, uh, an example and a plan that is followed with Jesus who dies outside the city. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. Exodus 33 and verse 7 reads, Now Moses used to make to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp 
some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. His first meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance. Let's remember that pillar of cloud. While the Lord spoke to Moses, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of his tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. It's amazing that in this example, in Exodus chapter 33, that Moses had an intentional relationship with God. God had already called him, God had already used him to liberate the Jewish people and bring them into the desert, making their way to the promised land. Because of their rebellion, that trip that should have been 40 days ended up being 40 years. And while they're in the, the desert, <coughs> Moses set up a tent, said, this is where I'm going to go and talk to God. Moses had both a public and a private relationship with God. It was public because everyone saw him going to the tent. But it was private because he was there with God, talking to God face to face. The, one of the things I think that's challenging is that we don't recognize that who you are in private who is who people eventually find out that you are in public. So sometimes we try to project a public image that is not consistent with the private reality. And that happens a lot in church. Can we talk? People come to church and in church you raise your hand. And all of heaven says, well, you raise your hand when you're around people. But do you raise your hand when it's just you and God? Don't think for a second that God misses that or the angels miss that. And hell definitely doesn't miss that. Hell watches you. They're like, yep, there you go. That's one. I got one. They like to play church. Works for me. You can play church all you want. But what matters is that your private life and your public life are one. Now, if we're honest, we're all flawed. So publicly, we've got to be honest about it. Publicly, we should lift our hands and praise to God if you feel so moved to do. If you don't, don't lift your hands because others are lifting their hands. Only lift your hands if that's what God's put on your heart to do. We should sing out in praise to God. But make sure that your worship is not just a Sunday morning from 10 to 11.30 thing. But it's all throughout the week. Now you see, for me, it's real easy. Because they only let me speak here. They don't let me sing. So my worship is always six days a week. <laughs> and then they keep me as far away from the mic as possible. That's about as close as they'll let me get. Y'all laugh in and laugh. You don't know. <laughs> I am married to this beautiful singer, Tasha, who comes from a singing family. My family can sing. I'm pretty convinced my kids can sing, but they are not ready to sing just yet. But I cannot sing. When I go to heaven, I'll be able to sing. When I go to heaven, I'll be able to dance. Just so you know, not all black people can dance. I'm lifting my hands to God. I'm just letting you know, not all of them. Just, that's just, that's a myth. And I have clarified that that myth is a myth. But Moses had a private and a public relationship with God. What's also really amazing about this passage of scripture is Moses' aide, Joshua, teaches us something about the commitment to transformation that we all need to have. Now, Moses did not grow up as a slave. He was only a slave for three months, his first three months. And then he was adopted into Pharaoh's family, the greatest world power of the time. 
He was in the royal family. He learned to be a ruler. He learned to handle things and to manage the world, at least in his own mind, through that lens. So his response to injustice was violence. When he saw injustice at the age of 40, he said, I know how to handle this, violence. Why? Because that's what he learned growing up. And then God took him and took the next 40 years of his life and taught him submission, taught him service, taught him to be a shepherd. Shepherds were held in the lowest regard by the Egyptians. And so he went from the highest place to the lowest place, and he had to learn. So that 40 years later, when he saw the burning bush, he could respond to God. But Joshua, however, grew up a slave. For the first 40 years of his life, he was a slave until Moses showed up. Moses showed up and God used him to liberate God's people. And then Joshua would spend the next 40 years of his life learning how to be a free man. Now when we talk about slavery in Virginia or in America, it hits a chord. When you talk about slavery right now, it hits a chord. Let me just be really clear. This is our position. Turn over to John chapter 8. Just so you know where we stand. John chapter 8, Jesus says this. In verse 31, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now here's the truth. And just so you know, this is not a good conversation. This conversation starts out great. Everybody believes in Jesus. They're like, I love Jesus, we love you. And then Jesus says, hey, I'm going to tell you the truth. Oh, well. The truth is, in verse 34, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You see, everybody, we believe that America is still enslaved. Ouch. As in sin enslaves you. Now let me just be plain. I am very excited about the end of physical bondage. I'm very excited about the end of slavery in our world. I'm very excited that we have a commitment to eradicate slavery with our mouths. Exactly. But do we have a commitment to eradicate slavery in our hearts? Because today there are more physical slaves in the world than there were 150 years ago. There are more sex slaves. There are more people that are enslaved that make products all around the world and in our country. Slavery is alive because greed is alive, because pride is alive, because selfishness is alive. If you want to end something, you have to go inside. You have to transform from the inside. If you are controlled by pictures on a screen that sap you of your energy, that's slavery. If you are controlled by what people think about you, that's slavery. If you are controlled by what people tell you instead of what God says about you, that's slavery. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to confuse the issues. Racism is wrong because it's a lie and because it's slavery. When God created every single human being, every single one, we were all given incredible blessings from God. And we're all created in the image of God. God is not black. God is not white. God is not Asian. God is not Latino. God is not all the different backgrounds that we all come from. God is God, and God created all of us equally. So these things are not only morally wrong, they are biblically wrong, but it is not enough to believe that something's wrong and to say what you stand against. You have to stand for something. We stand for transformation on the inside. That doesn't happen unless you go to the tent. See, Joshua was physically free, but it took him 40 years to unlearn putting his head down when his head should have been up. Walking with confidence when he 
felt like he should walk in a, in a slavish way. Being a leader, instead of always feel like he needed to be a follower, it took a lifetime to learn that. Are you committed to take the time to be with God, to be in the tent like Joshua and Moses were, to lose your pride and to gain your confidence, to lose your selfishness and to become selfless like God is? That doesn't happen for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. Right. And anybody that tells you that are the same people that tell you that if you take one pill, wow, you have muscles. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. You got to put the time in. You got to put the time in. Amen? Amen. I just wanted to keep it 100 with you. Yeah. Hope you come back to church. <laughs> now you tell me I got to work out. It's the second week you tell me I got to work out. Just so you know, I don't like to work out either. I like to eat food, but I'm trying to stay alive. <laughs> I got kids. <laughs> you got to stay in the tent. Single men. It is hard to be a single man and profess to follow Jesus. Yes, it is. In a world that is telling you that you should be sexually moral, that is telling you that it is okay for you to objectify women once they don't know about it. Right. That is wrong. Yeah. It doesn't matter if no one knows. Who you are on the inside will eventually come out. Yeah. Yeah. My beautiful young sisters, you should only give your heart to someone who's willing to give their heart to God. Right. This isn't about what the church's position is. This is about your heart. Above all else, the Proverbs tell us, you should guard your heart. Because it, everything comes out of that. It is a wellspring of life. You have to stay into the, in the tent long enough to work that out. Joshua did. Moses did. God wants us to do that. Amen? Amen. I want to invite you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm really hoping we can be friends afterwards. <laughs> you done talked about slavery. I don't know what you're what you saying. 2 Corinthians. I'm just saying, if you're in Virginia, you have to talk about real stuff, right? Yeah. You can't like avoid what's going on in the world or the injustice that's going on in the world and pretend that we can just sing songs. There's this amazing book, I encourage you to read it. It's called When a Nation Forgets God. Mm. And I'll never forget Mr. Don, who moved, um, you know, when, when the Hollands moved, he's, I believe he's in Colorado now. But Mr. Don gave this book to me, When a Nation Forgets God. And, it's all about the church in Nazi Germany. And, uh, and there's a story told of a church in Nazi Germany that the church was right by the railroad tracks as Jews were being carted off to these death camps, the concentration camps. And whenever the Jews would be screaming at the top of their lungs, asking for someone to save them as they were passing by with the train, the song director was directed by the pastor to sing louder because they didn't want it to disturb their worship service. So they just sang louder and louder and louder. And the person that told the story talks about how they could hear the mixes of the songs and the screams of the people as that's happening. So many churches in America right now, all people are doing is say, sing louder. Drown it out. Don't deal with the real issues. The real issues require that we do the dirty work of going into our hearts and dealing with ourselves first, but also confronting the ugly realities of what's going on in our world. It's sin that we're seeing alive in the world. And don't pray for a time where it's like Mayberry, where everybody's saying nice stuff, but everything's happening in, in, the, in the dark. Thank God that the curtain's being pulled back so we can see the lack of moral character that we have in our world, so we can see the ugliness in our family, so we can turn our face to God and be transformed. That is our role as Christians. We must model what we preach. It is not enough that we preach it. We must practice it. And then we have to engage in the world. But thanks be to God, he gives us his Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says this. Now if the ministry that brought death 
which was engraved in letters on stone came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? And if the ministry that condemned men is glorious, how much glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? I mean, verse 10 of chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians. But what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're bold. I'm telling you straight up that we're a messed up group of people that serve a perfect God that has the solution for our community. That is either incredibly arrogant, completely delusional, or absolutely true. The solution is we have to turn our face to God. The solution is we have to live transformed lives. And that is a bold assertion. See, we are not like Moses. We talked about Moses' practice, but we're not like Moses. Because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we are not like Moses. He would have to put a veil to keep the Israelites from gazing while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, when the veil, the veil remains when the old covenant is read, and it has been removed, only, uh, rather, uh, it has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is no slavery. What does that mean? You are not controlled by your phone. You are not controlled by the internet. You do not have to give in to porn. You do not have to be addicted to substances. I'm not saying you don't have a chemical problem, but what I'm saying is you don't have to be controlled by it. I'm not saying there isn't generational things you have to work through. You may have to be in the tent for a while, but you don't have to be a slave. We do not have to be slaves to racial prejudice. The people today that take and practice falsehoods about who other human beings are do not have to remain that way. We live in a dynamic world where the worst offender can be transformed. So those who are considered our enemies are the ones we must love. But you can't do that unless you're changed from the inside. You can't love that much. See, here's our position. This is who we follow, Jesus. This is an exposed position. We love those that are on the right and those that are on the left. We love those that are in the middle. We love everyone. This is our position. You got to be a bad man to walk into a gunfight like this. This is how you walk in. Like, you know how gun people can tell you. Like, you know what? Like, this is how we go into the fight. See what happens. Either you're crazy or somebody's with you. You got some kind of protection that's different. And what I'm telling you is in our world today, we need people that can do this. We don't need people that can rally for one side or rally for another. We need people that have the courage to do this. But this only happens when this is transformed. It is the heart that has to be transformed. And that is no small thing. It says right here in verse 18, and we who have with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory that comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Therefore, chapter 4, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. If you look at the news long enough, you're going to lose heart unless you have this hope. We don't lose heart. 
Rather, we renounce secret and we renounce shameful ways. It is morally wrong, it is shameful to degrade anyone based on where they come from or what they look like or what challenges they have. That's just wrong. It is equally wrong to demonize the people that are doing that. Because they need to be saved too. I mean, what you gonna do? What happens when they roll up in church and you've been talking bad about them? And then we got the website so they can look at the video from last week. You can't be talking bad about people. You're here to bring salvation, not condemnation. But we do renounce secret and shameful ways. See, we don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God, noted lower G, God of this age, also referred to as the prince of this world, also referred to as the devil, Satan, the accuser. He is God because people worship his ways. If you speak like him, then don't be deceived. You are his child. But you don't have to stay that way. You weren't born his child. You weren't born his worshiper. But if you speak like Satan, if you use lies and deception and dishonesty, if you denigrate other people, then you are not standing with God. But you could change. We always hear, our hands are open. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So if you're visiting today, let me explain. Some churches you go to, it's about the pastor. Pastor, Pastor Appreciation Day. <laughs> I am a pastor. I do serve as a minister here. This is not my church. This is our church. We are all ministers of reconciliation. I am tasked as a servant of the church, as are all of our staff. That's who we are. That's what we do. That is a hard job. So please don't say Pastor. <laughs> but if you have bad stuff to say, please let us know. I prefer if it's not on Monday. Sundays are usually long, but it's okay if it's on Monday. But I might call you on Tuesday. Just let you know. It's not mine. It's ours. It's ours because it's God's. We cannot speak for ourselves and still be aligned with God. When you go to churches where it is about the pastor, or it is about the church, instead of it being about God, it is because they are either misled or they are intentionally misleading people. It has been my experience that most people are just misled. There are very few people that are intentionally misleading people. It is my experience that we should very, very, be very careful about ascribing evil to a person. Most people are just being puppeted by evil. And they're unaware of what they're doing. But it is important that as Christians, we are clear-eyed about the world that we find ourselves in. And clear-eyed about the call of Christ for us to be transformed from within. Turn over to the book of Daniel chapter 10. You still with me? Daniel chapter 10, we see something that's pretty amazing. Daniel serves as a prime minister under Nebuchadnezzar. Um, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and in that dream he knows that his glorious Babylonian empire will not always be the head of the world. In fact, the Medo-Persians will take their place. It doesn't happen in Nebuchadnezzar's lifetime, but in his uh, nephew Belshazzar's lifetime, uh, the, the Medo-Persians take over and in the third year of the Medo-Persian reign, Daniel once more a government minister under not only the Babylonians, but also the Medo-Persians, has a vision. 
says, on the third year, in the third year, chapter 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message is true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice foods, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three, week, three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing at the bank of the great river, the Tigris, and I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in, in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, and his face was like lightning, and his eyes were flaming torches, and his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice was like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I, left, I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deadly pale, and I was helpless. If you know what this person looks like, or you've heard this story before, it's because John, who wrote the Gospel of John that we read a lot, and wrote Revelation through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, refers to this same character, and makes it plain that that is Jesus. The resurrected Christ. Daniel is seeing the pre-incarnate Christ. When you see Jesus, you're not going to be able to speak. I'm not going to be able to speak. The fear of God will naturally fall on us when we see Jesus. But Jesus comes and he's responding to Daniel's prayer. But what I love about this passage, and we won't read the whole passage, but I encourage you to read it on your own. What I love about this passage is the conversation that Jesus has face to face with Daniel. In verse 12, it says, He continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. From the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of Persia of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came and helped me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Why am I reading this to you? This Jesus that we see, this pre-incarnate Christ, took Daniel, a government minister's breath away. A guy that had spent his whole government career going before Nebuchadnezzar, going before Belshazzar, going before Cyrus the Great. He had seen all the great men of his time. But now he sees this angelic figure and it takes his breath away. He can't even breathe. He is terrified. And this figure explains to him that when you, when the moment you started praying, I heard you. But it's taken me 21 days to get to you because I had to fight to get to you. Here's the reality. The stuff that you see is not what's going on. It's not. You might think it's about black or white. You might think it's about you know, immigration. You might think it's about where people come from. You might think it's about America's place in the world. It's not about that. It's about good and evil. It's about light and dark. And you can't fight evil with your human strength. You can't legislate this out. You can't pay evil off. Evil's just evil. Only God can save us now. Are you aligned with God? Mm. Have you humbled yourself before God? Come on, talk about it. Are you willing in your private place to walk with God, to overcome the real challenges that you face, that your family faces, that our communities face, that our country faces, that our world faces? Come on. I believe categorically that God is the answer. Yeah. 
Amen. Now, I don't believe that to the exclusion of doing practical things in the here and now. I'm not going to say, God is the answer. People don't need food. That don't make no sense. <laughs> if you are a follower of Jesus, you give the people food. If you are a follower of Jesus, you protect those who are being treated, mistreated. You stand up for what's right. You speak the truth. But be sure that you are changed from the inside. Come on. Because in your desire to do good, if there's evil within you, <coughs> evil may come out as well. Daniel humbled himself before God. We need God to face the things that are ahead of us. Church, we need to recognize that spiritual forces are greater than physical forces. Let's read one more passage, 2 Kings chapter 6. They have them going through the Bible, you're like, man, you got me turning everywhere. <laughs> but if you're tapping, it's real easy. <laughs> tap, tap, tap. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm not going to read this whole passage. I know you got to make it to lunch. I respect lunch. And I want to make sure that we patronize all the local areas. And if you get the food you cooked at home, you might have had it in the crock pot. You don't want to burn it. That's what you're thinking about now. 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha is in his house. And the, the, the armies of the Arameans have decided that they are going to go ahead and, and besiege Elijah's house because Elijah's been telling the king of Israel the, the words that the king of Aram has been speaking in, in his bedroom because God gave him the revelation to know that. And so their solution is we've got the spiritual guy that knows what we're talking about. So what we're going to do is roll up on him with an army like he's not going to know. Okay, don't, don't worry about that. I'm just saying it. Didn't make sense from the start. Not a good strategy. But they decide to do that. So they come and they surround his house. And early that morning, his servant gets up and goes out. And he sees the force. And he is terrified by what he sees. He's petrified. And in verse 15, it says, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, and the army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. He said, oh my Lord. Or it depends on where he came from. Oh God. He was just, it, you know, don't, don't act like you haven't done that before. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you come from, you're like, oh boy. Holy cow. I don't know what you say. Oh my Lord. What shall we do to serve the servant asked. Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Amen. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And when the Lord opened the servant's eyes, he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You know, I was so moved by how the Holy Spirit's moving. And I saw the song list that was posted on, on Facebook for today. The first song that we saw was Surrounded. I don't know how it is in your life. You might feel surrounded. You might feel like you're surrounded by so much stress, so much anxiety. Your family's surrounded by challenging situations. Maybe you're surrounded by sadness. Maybe when you look at what's going on in our world, in our community, you feel surrounded by despair, and there seems to be no hope. You feel like our country's surrounded by hatred. But I'm here to tell you that those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Because it's not about the numbers that you see. All the seats in this room are filled. Because God fights with us. Because we fight with Him. Let's make sure that we gather with Jesus so that we can be on the right side of this fight. Take the time this week to gather with him. Let me pray for you. Let's pray. God, I, I am so grateful. Grateful that we can be in a, in a place where we are speaking the truth plainly and unapologetically, God. I thank you so much for the sacrifice of so many who have sacrificed so that we can have this freedom. And I'm grateful for it, God. 
But I recognize that though we have physical freedom in our country, we have so much slavery in our world. So many people are oppressed. So many people are in bondage. We have a real opioid crisis, God. As people are in bondage, God, held in chains, God. Families broken up because of this, God. 7% of this neighborhood, this community, this county, God, doesn't even have enough food, God, when we throw away so much food. God, there's so much pain in our world. And we can feel surrounded by all the darkness and all the evil, but God, I pray that we would cling to you, that we would turn to you, that we would gather with you. I pray that we would imitate Joshua and stay longer in the tent this week. I pray, God, that we would imitate Moses and learn humility so we can lead your people. And I pray that every man and woman who's declared that Jesus is Lord would remember what the scriptures teach, that we are greater than John the Baptist, that we would be very bold as we go in the world, and that we would not deal with the surface issues, but we'd be willing to go into the womb and be willing to bring healing and wholeness as you brought healing and wholeness into our lives. Help us, God, as we gather now. Be with our friends and neighbors, God, who have not yet made the decision to make Jesus Lord. Move their hearts, God, because we need every man, every woman to stand firm and to stand with you and to be rooted in you, transformed from the inside out. God, help us as a church as we gather with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.